We got one more guest here for this Wednesday edition of Bang the Book Radio. That is Wes Reynolds at Wes Reynolds and the number one on Twitter. Wes, how's it going today, man? Good morning, Adam. I'm doing all right. How about yourself, sir? Doing well, buddy. Appreciate the time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. And, you know, as I was kind of talking through that previous segment with Kyle and as I was sort of looking at yesterday's slate of college basketball games, a lot of really good games. And we saw some really good teams either get tripped up or come very close to it. Obviously, Duke, I mean, down 23 in the second half, whether they won the game or not, not a great performance from them. Michigan getting beat by Penn State, a Penn State team that I think had, what, one Big Ten win coming into that game. So it's just kind of that time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, when you're getting so many big games, now that we're in February and now that, uh, you know, football essentially is over, putting the the AAF aside, uh, all these guys have been knee-deep in football are now kind of entering into this college basketball market. And, uh, you know, you're getting to the point where there's uh, some conference championships about about to be decided, you know, even before you get to the conference tournament. And, uh a lot of the a lot of these games, uh, you know, get put. They're they're so important, especially when you have two good teams playing each other. And then you get some of these spots where you get a team like a Penn State, who you know who has been struggling and only had one Big Ten win, but they had been competitive in a lot of these games. They just didn't have enough to get over the hump in a lot of them. But you had to kind of think at some point there's going to be a spot that's going to be right. And and Penn even with you know, when they've had some of their lower teams or whether they've had some of their better teams, you know, they're always kind of an underdog. It's a tough place to win. Uh, it's one of the toughest jobs, I think, in the conference, in the Big Ten. But they always trip somebody up. They always beat a Michigan State. They always beat some kind of big boy. And you're getting a lot of these spots that are happening where you've got these games against lower teams before you play a big team. I mean, there's kind of one tonight with uh, – uh, South Carolina and Tennessee. Tennessee knows with Kentucky losing last night that that uh, you know that team's going to be ready for them. It's college game day. Tennessee goes into Rupp Arena as the number one team in the country, and now they get a South Carolina team who they ended up beating by 22 on the road. But the game was a little bit closer than that until about the final 10 minutes when South Carolina kind of ran out of gas, and you know. And you're seeing a little bit of movement toward the South Carolina side, which I agree with, because I think this is kind of a tough spot for Tennessee. Well, and as you look up and down the board here a little bit, you know, as you mentioned, South Carolina down from plus 17 into the plus 14 and a half range now. I uh, bet online and bookmaker, a lot of 15 still out there. But even yesterday, you know, the game between Marquette and DePaul, you know, DePaul was taking some sharp money early in the day. They're down from four to three. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're going to, to have to pay attention to – excuse me. You have to pay attention to the scale of the line moves based on where the spread is. But, you know, it seems like it, it just kind of is that time of the year. So do you sort of bet with that in mind, or are you, you know, really looking to take advantage of the spot plays that are out there? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's a little bit of both, uh, where, you, where, where you're, you're, you know, you're looking at some of those spots. And, you know, obviously with spot plays, nothing hits 100%. There's a lot of things that look like good spots, like DePaul I thought was a good spot. And and uh, last night, and, you know, Marquette, credit to them. That's a, that, that shows me a lot about their team, that they can go into a tricky spot like that and win and cover pretty easily. But, I mean, you know, some of these teams, uh, especially as you get into the, you know, later in the season, I think these teams are still trying, you know, but some of these teams also know that their only chance is to win the conference tournament. So maybe they're, maybe they're going to focus on that a little bit more and just kind of trying some things out and, uh, you know, working, working within that framework to try to, you know, see what they can maybe pull off in a conference tournament, especially in these one bid leagues. Well, and, and it's always interesting, too, in the one-bid leagues here at this time of the year. Like, Liberty and Lipscomb play each other again tonight. And, and that was a pretty interesting game the first time around. Uh, you know, those are very clearly the two best teams in the Atlantic Sun Conference. You know, that's that's a litmus test game for you now at this time of the year. And there are certain advantages to seeding when it comes to conference tournaments. But also, you kind of look at it and say, you know, for two teams that are in a one-bid league, that are clearly the class of it, 
you know, how much of an effort do they put forth in some of their remaining conference games? That could be an angle here as well. Yeah, this is that game you mentioned specifically is even more interesting because it's probably not going to happen. You know, you're going to hear this term as you watch television, eye test. But the committee doesn't use an eye test, which sometimes you kind of wish they did, and look at more basketball. And, I mean, yeah, let's come, you know, they're going to put them how many, you know, wins they have in the top 50, how many quadrant one wins. But if you watch this Lipscomb team, I mean, they're rated, I think, 33rd in the, in the Ken Palm. They're 20-4. and four. This is a team that's good enough to be an at-large team. This is a team that could knock some power conference team, teams off. I mean, they've already won it. They won at TCU. They won at SMU. They played a very close game at Louisville. Uh, two of their losses are to Belmont, who's another pretty good team in a likely one bid league conference in, in the OVC. Fortunate that some of these conferences are one bid leagues because a team like Lipscomb is certainly good enough. And, and you know, Liberty isn't a bad team, and they got waxed at home by this team. I mean, you got a Liberty team that's already 21 and 5, and we're not even to mid February. And, uh, you know, I think the, these two teams, I mean, clearly this is going to decide the conference championship, I think, in the regular season, especially tonight with one team being 11 and 0 and Liberty being 10 and 1 and then the next best team is NJIT at 6 and 4 in the league. So this is essentially the regular season title for that league on the line tonight. Well, and if Lipscomb wins this game, I think we may run into a betting angle that you really like to look at a lot, something I think makes a lot of sense here at this time of the year and and may sort of creep in or factor into what we talked about at the top of the segment with these really good teams kind of having these flat spots, these letdown spots. If Lipscomb wins tonight, I do think that they kind of fall into that fat and happy mentality that you like to talk about. Explain what that means to our listeners. Yeah. I mean, and I usually, you know, use it a little bit for more of ranked teams, but you know, these teams that win three or more in a row to their ranked teams. And, and I mean, then the market adjusts to them accordingly. Now, I don't believe that Lipscomb is going to be ranked. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm sure they're probably in that also receiving votes category. But, you know, they win tonight, and then they go face uh, uh, Kennesaw State on the road, I believe, on Saturday, and uh, a team that they beat by 29 at home back in January and 2-8 and eight in the league that, you know, they're going to be laying well over, over double digits to this team. And – you know, when you're a beast in one of these small conferences and you're clearly the best team, and, and Lipscomb would certainly would certainly qualify, I guess, in that category in the A-Sun, you're the everybody's game of the year because you got a chance with, with a disappointing season to knock off the conference champion. So you know that even though you have an underdog that's an inferior team, you know that you're at least going to get an honest effort out of that underdog, and that's what I think you're always you're always looking for. So, you know, I mean, you know, you're just looking for those spots, and then Lipscomb, you know, could potentially really clinch the title tonight, regular in the one seed in the A Sun tournament. You know, how hard are they going to really be going at Kennesaw State on Saturday? So in terms of the major conference teams here, with that, you know, fat and happy sort of angle, are, are there any teams that you feel like fit that criteria right now that you may look to go against, you know, here this week or this weekend? Well, I mentioned the one tonight with uh, going against Tennessee, taking uh, taking South Carolina. Uh, another one that maybe and, – and, and a lot of these have actually worked out a little bit more in the first half than maybe they have the full game because the team's kind of – fall apart a little bit and I mean and you still got to be a little bit uh, in the second half but you still got to be a little bit picky I mean if you're looking at like what Gonzaga is doing in the WCC I mean they just blew out San Francisco and St. Mary's who are two pretty quality teams I mean I think clearly you know number two and three in the league and you know Gonzaga really ran them out and so with some of these non-power six conferences you do have to be, I guess, a little bit careful. I mean, there's not a ton of these spots tonight. I mean, maybe Wake Forest in the first half against Florida State who comes off that big comeback win over Louisville who really, 
has should have won their last two games, blew the lead the the twenty three point lead to Duke last night, and also blew a game at Tallahassee on Saturday. So they may be a team you want to go against uh, in their in their next time out. But you know you're seeing some of these teams uh, tomorrow. Houston could be a team maybe to go against. Uh, they just beat Cincinnati. They look like they're pretty much in control right now in the American Athletic Conference. And then they go to a UConn team that's been a little bit disappointing, that's 13 and 11, got some injuries with, uh, with Jalen Adams out. But maybe this is a game where they really, where they really step up. So, uh, you know, that could be a team to go against. You know, a lot of these teams that have won several in a row, you know, some you got to pick your spots again, like Gonzaga is playing at Loyola Marymount tonight, a Loyola Marymount team that's uh, uh, 17 and 8. So, you know, maybe going against the Zags at home on this streak isn't a good idea, but you can maybe find a spot on the road where they get a tougher game than anticipated. Now, one more game I want to ask you about here, and then we'll transition over to golf for a few minutes. Did Purdue fall into that trap last night? I mean, their 18 points in the second half really took me by surprise. Was that sort of a fat and happy type of thing, or was that just, you know, maybe uh, the pressures of starting out a little bit slow and then having to get back into the race, get back into the equation? It was a little bit of both. I mean, and I, and I think you had, you've had a Purdue team that's clearly – I think exceeded expectations. I mean, I think the demise was maybe a little bit exaggerated because I think Purdue has a strong program culture where they weren't going to all of a sudden, even though they lost four senior starters, they weren't all of a sudden going to be like 10th in the league and be down there with Northwestern and, and Rutgers. But I think it's clearly a surprise that they were leading the conference. And, and, you know, they were also playing a pretty good team. I didn't understand, you know, I thought the line should have been, maybe around pick and stayed there when it opened. But when you saw Purdue get to about minus three, it's like, hey, this Maryland team's got some dudes. They're as athletic and as talented as almost anybody in the conference. And I just thought that that was a really tricky spot. But you saw Purdue got off to a strong start, and then Maryland put the clamps on them. And, I, I mean, only held them, when I was looking through the scores, only held them to 18 points in the second half. And – uh I mean, I, I think that that was kind of a tricky spot for Purdue when you've got a team that maybe didn't expect this prosperity and didn't expect to, I think, be the number one team in the conference. Then all of a sudden, the pressure, I think, does get to them. I mean, when you're a Duke and you have superior talent, you expect that you're going to get the team's best effort every single night, and you expect it to be where you are. But maybe when you're a Purdue, you didn't necessarily expect that. So I think they did get caught up in that. All right, so we move over to the golf side here, talk about something a little bit different. But, uh, man, what a field here on hand at Riviera Country Club for the Genesis Open. DJ, JT, Rory, DeChambeau, Rom, Watson, who's a three-time winner here. Matsuyama's taking some love this week. Lefty just won last week at Pebble Beach. Shoffley, Spieth, Finau, Woods. This is, uh, out, you know, you're missing Ricky Fowler and, and Jason Day, but, Outside of that, I mean, this is a who's who type of field. Yeah, this is a, really a loaded field. And then, obviously, uh, you know, that, that man, Tiger Woods, is in the field, but he has not had a lot of success. It's one of the few places he hasn't had a lot of success at. But, uh, yeah, I think that this is a, a really, really elite field. It's in a big market. It's in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a, it's a ball strikers course. It's a course for shot shapers where all different types of players win. Driving distance obviously helps. You've seen Bombers win here, the Bubba Watsons and the Dustin Johnsons, but you've seen ball strikers win here, the Steve Strickers and the Bill Haases. So, you know, this is a course that I really like this because I think it rewards creativity, you know, and there are so many different ways to course where it's not just, okay, driver, pitching wedge, putt, you know, where it's not those long courses where length is the, the, always the determining factor. This is a course where a lot of different type of guys can win. Well, and this is a challenging course because of that, because it does take some creativity. So it's really not a big surprise at all that somebody like Bubba Watson has played well here. Phil Mickelson, he's played well here. You know, a couple of guys that are really creative shot makers with their second shots and you know, obviously, sometimes around the green as well, they do some different types of things. So, tell us about Riviera. Outside of 
you know, it being a course that you know, does reward creativity, does work for a lot of different types of players. What else are we looking at here with this par 71 that is pretty long at 7,300 yards? Yeah, and uh, it, it was a redesign by Tom Spazio, and some of the redesigns that he's had a part in include Quail Hollow, where the Wells Fargo Championship is held, a couple of U.S. Open venues with Marion, Oakmont, Conway Farms, where you've seen some BMW championships uh, held. Uh, you know, the Greens, uh, Bentgrass, Poa Nua, and Kikuya Fairways, uh, you know, similar surfaces to what the guy saw in Torrey Pines, uh, a couple weeks ago. So uh, that led me to a, a couple guys that played well. And one of them you've already mentioned, Matsuyama, fourth year in 2015. I think he really fits this course in terms of his ball striking. And I think he'll like this putting surface. And that's always the bugaboo with Matsuyama is putting. Same one where he played well at, at Torrey Pines a few weeks ago. And uh, going back to that event, he was six gained, six in the field and strokes gained and approached the green third in strokes game tee to green. Uh, so the ball striking is obviously there, and he's got to knock down a couple putts. A uh, couple guys, you know, a little bit down the board, maybe from the favorites in the 10 to 15 to 1 range that I, that I looked at. Uh, looked at uh, also played Tony Finau and Patrick Cantlay. These guys were actually the co-first round leaders here last year and ended up both shooting three of their four rounds in the 60s uh, last year. Finau was second, Cantlay was fourth. Cantlay took off last week was one of the many withdrawals from Pebble Beach because I think these guys, I don't think it was an injury. I think it was these guys saw that weather and weren't sure how the course was going to be because, you know, they saw it was pretty waterlogged. Now the weather didn't end up playing much of a factor, but I think they kind of saw that and begged off and decided to maybe give it a go this week. So uh, I'm not all that weary of taking Cantlay necessarily here. And, and then another angle that I like for Cantlay, the 2012 NCAA championship was held here at Riviera. It was actually won by Thomas Peters when he was at University of Illinois. He was playing over in the uh, Perth event on the European tour this week. But there were, there were five guys in the field that were in the top in that event in 2012. Patrick Cantlay and Justin Thomas, obviously the two main class players. Uh, Max Homa, who's a guy that played at Cal, uh, came off the uh, web.com, got his card back uh, this year. And then a couple guys that I took, if you like maybe some bombs to take for top tens, if you don't want to bet the win, uh, bet uh, Keith Mitchell and Patrick Rogers, who are both at about 201, were also top ten here. So, you know, you'll find some guys, even with this class of the field, and even with these this many chalky elite players in the field, you will find some guys, I think, that will finish on that first page of the leaderboard Sunday that are longer shots, and I think those two could fit the bill. I really do like that list of names. I noticed one that you posted on Twitter, at West Rounds of the number one, that you didn't mention, Adam Scott. And another guy that's played really well here is Kevin Na. So it looks like also, too, if you're a guy that can get into a groove with the flat stick, this is a course where you can put up some numbers as well. Yeah, and I did play Adam Scott. Uh, he's former winner here, was second here in 2016. And, you know, he's fallen off, I mean, from, from when he was a top five or top ten player. But I, I saw some encouraging signs. Uh, didn't make the cut at Pebble Beach, but I kind of throw that out because that's such a unique event with the pro-am portion and playing three different courses, the, you know, the three days. I don't put too much weight into how you did at Pebble Beach the week before. Go back to Torrey Pines. Where, where he was on the first page of the leaderboard. Uh, first in the field in strokes gained approaching the green. Fourth in shots gained key to green. And like Matsuyama, the bugaboo with Scott has always been his putting. And I don't think, you know, he probably hasn't fully recovered from that anchor ban, uh, you know, because he used that long putter against his body. And, uh, you know, they changed the rule for that. But, you know, I saw some encouraging signs from Scott. Uh, at Torrey Pines, and he's a guy still with one of the sweetest swings in the entire game, and I think he's a guy that may be getting a little bit overlooked here with the quality of the field. One other thing I want to ask you about here, away from this event, you know, we're leaving California next week. We got the WGC Mexico Championship, then the alternate event for the guys who aren't the WGC, the Puerto Rico Open, then it's basically the Florida Swing, Honda, Arnold Palmer, Players, you know, so then we get into the Florida swing where we talk about the desert swing and the California swing. 
A lot of guys tend to play really well there. Now we go to Florida. A lot of guys tend to play really well down in the southeast in some of those more coastal courses. So, you know, how much of that factors into it, the mental side here for these guys of knowing, hey, I'm a good California player, now we're leaving. Or, hey, I'm a good Florida player, I can't wait to get down there. How much of that factors into it for you at this time of the year as we start looking ahead to that road to the Masters? It did a little bit for me because, uh, you know, I actually considered in terms of one of the shorter prices, I considered Rory McIlroy, and there's some people I respect that kind of like him this week. Rory has always been, I think, a better Florida player than he's been, and I think he's, he's, he's coming close to winning again, but he's always been a better Florida guy than a California guy. And, you know, when you look, he's won at the Honda before, and then you start to get the Bay Hill, you start to get to the players, you start to get to Tampa Bay at the Valspar. Uh, you know, I think, you know, you see some guys and then, you know, there's the correlations that you make. Some guys are better at putting on Bermuda, you know, like a Russell Henley or, or those type of players than maybe they are on Bet Grass and Poa Anua. And I mean, you just look at those different, different correlations. And, uh, you know, I think there's some guys that are going to be excited. I'll be interested to see who skips the, uh, the Mexico event last week, and then maybe just go straight to Florida for a week off to prepare for a busier than usual swing with the players championship being moved back to March since the PGA is now in May this year. Uh, So, you know, that I do take that into a little bit of account because I mean, there are some guys that just, you know, I think kind of thrive in March in, in Florida. And as you, as you kind of get down to that home stretch for the masters, well, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I kind of wonder about that. We talk a lot about situational capping in, in a lot of other sports, and, and it seems like there's, to a degree, you know, some level of situational handicapping here in golf in the sense that, you know, some guys may be using some early season tournaments to, yeah, get a paycheck, but also to try and, you know, round into form for the two WGC events coming up in the next five weeks. You've got the Masters. Then a month later, you've got the PGA. A month later, the U.S. Open. Guys – you know, they still want to win. They still want, you know, that million dollar purse, but also there are things they want to work on in, you know, actual, for lack of a better term, game conditions. Absolutely. And, and I mean, it's thrown off the schedule totally this year. I mean, you're not seeing as you're seeing a lot of these European guys be over here a lot earlier this year. And I think the, the good events really on the European tour, the desert swing aside have kind of been back ended with, the open championship being the last major of the year. And that's in July. And then of course, as you get to the race to Dubai in the fall, I mean, so you're seeing uh, these fields, I think be a lot stronger with, with, you know, Rory and Justin Rose and, uh, you know, a lot of the top flight European players, Carol Hatton, uh, Norin Cabrera Bayo playing over here a lot earlier this year, because I think that they know that the big tournaments are so front ended this year. Wes Reynolds, it's always a treat, man, at Wes Reynolds and the number one on Twitter. Appreciate the time, as always, buddy. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again next week. You bet, Adam. Looking forward to it.